Hey, hey, it's Dr. J. Our lesson is 2.4, complex numbers. Let's get right into it. Um, to begin the study of complex numbers, also known as imaginary numbers, we start with the definition. The square root of negative 1. And we define this symbol to be the number i. Notice I'm not calling it the letter i. This is a number. It's called the imaginary unit. That's one of the reasons why some people refer to these as imaginary numbers. Okay. Now it does look like the letter i. And so to distinguish it from the letter i, I put this little curve on it. So it kind of looks like a backwards j. Yeah. And that distinguishes it from the letter i. It is not the letter i, it is the number i. It's an imaginary number such that it represents the square root of negative 1. So in the past, if we tried to simplify, say, the square root of negative 4, Prior to today, we would say that this does not exist, that you cannot take the square root of negative 4. In fact, um, if you think back just a couple days ago when we were doing the distance formula, if you were using the distance formula and you calculated the square root and you got a negative inside the square root, you would stop and you would probably go back and redo the problem because this would mean that you made a mistake. Yeah, but. In this section, we're intentionally putting the negative inside the square root to give us the imaginary unit. So to simplify the square root of negative 4, you would write this as the square root of 4 times negative 1. So you would factor the negative 4 as positive 4 times negative 1. We would simplify each square root individually. I can go ahead and remove the parentheses now because I don't necessarily need them. You might wonder, why did you use them in the first place? Well, I don't want that to look like subtraction. I want it to look like multiplication. So uh, whenever I have multiplication of a negative number, I like to use parentheses to make it very clear that I'm not subtracting. And now I can take the principal square root of 4, which is a positive number, it is 2, and then using this definition, the square root of negative 1 is i. So this is 2 times i, or we will simply write 2i. This is what we call a complex number. also known as an imaginary number. They get a little more complicated. Um, this is just the basic definition. Uh, keep this in mind throughout the lesson today. So I'll just put a little cloud up here in the corner so I don't forget the square root of negative 1 is always going to be i. Trying to get the autofocus. Come on. Come back to me. Come back to me. There we go. So let's do a few of these. Uh, let's simplify the square root of negative 144. Let's simplify the square root of negative 20. And let's simplify the square root of negative 13. OK. So the square root of negative 144, that would be the square root of positive 144 times the square root of negative 1. 
So that would be 12i. Remember, every time you see the square root of negative 1, that becomes i. And then the square root of 144, you already know from the previous lectures, square root of 144 is 12. Right. 20. Typically, we put the i on the right-hand side. So that's the reason why when I rewrite this, I always put the square root negative 1 on the right-hand side. You can do it inversely. You can put the negative one on the left, but then your answer will look backwards, and then you'll have to rewrite it at the end anyway. So this is what we call the standard form. The I always goes last. OK. Now this time we're stuck because 20 is not a perfect square. So we want to break up 20 a little bit more. And we're going to do 4 and 5. So that takes care of the 20. Square root of 20 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 5. And then the negative 1 will become the i. Now, one of these is perfect, the square root of 4. And the square root of 5 is not perfect. So when I simplify this completely, I'm going to say 2 square root of 5 and then i. The 5 is not a perfect square, so the 5 must remain inside the radical. Sometimes we rewrite it like this to put the i in between the 2 and the square root of 5. This is mainly done to prevent this from happening. So if you write it too fast, if you write this answer too fast, oftentimes when you're writing in your notes or something, you might accidentally put the square root symbol on top of the letter i, and that would not be appropriate. The i should be outside of the square root, not underneath the square root symbol. So you do not want to do this. All right, this is bad. Either one of these are OK. You can put 2 square root of 5 with the i clearly outside of the square root, or sometimes we put it in the middle just to be safe. In this example, 13 is not perfect. So we sometimes refer to 13 as hopeless. It cannot be simplified. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, it's also a prime number, so it has no factorizations. So there's nothing we can do about the 13. It's permanently stuck. The only thing that we can simplify is the negative 1. The square root of negative 1 is i. And by the same reasoning, you do not want to cover the i with the square root symbol. So sometimes we put it out in front just to be safe. OK? I mean, if you're careful, you can write it this way. But if you're sloppy, then I rep recommend doing it the safe way. That way you don't make a mistake. OK? So there you go. That's the introduction to imaginary numbers. Um, let's get into the, the, the details.
Okay, and then part C. There we go. Okay, they're getting a little harder now, a little more complicated now. Um, so we need to be careful here. We have a negative on the outside of the square root, and we have a negative on the inside of the square root. And one of my biggest pet peeves, if you've ever had my class before, if you've heard me talk, I am annoyed by the phrase, two negatives make a positive. That phrase has driven me crazy since my first day of teaching. And the reason is, when you say two negatives make a positive, that sticks, right? That's the kind of thing you learn when you're little and then, you know, you just keep that memory in your mind. Two negatives make a positive and every time you run into two negatives, immediately that thought comes to mind and it causes so much permanent mathematical damage. Two negatives do not always make a positive. The correct way to say it is a negative times a negative is a positive. That's the correct way to say it. This is not really a negative times a negative. This is a negative times an imaginary, which is not the same thing as a negative times a negative. So what we're gonna do is when there's a negative on the outside, we're gonna ignore it while we're solving the problem, but we're not going to forget it. Right, so we're gonna just keep it off to the back of our mind. That negative is there. We're gonna ignore it, but we're not gonna forget that it's there, okay? Uh, if you're afraid that you're going to forget, then you can go ahead and bring it over into the next step so that you don't forget it. So there it is right there. Don't forget it. But you're just basically ignoring it while you're doing the problem. This is what you actually want to calculate, the square root of negative 9. So that would be the square root of 9 times the square root of negative 1. When you get really good at this, you can skip this step. All right? And so I'm going to start putting this into the cloud of memory because you're going to be doing this so often you want to just be able to snap it out you don't want to have to write all of this down so the square root of 9 becomes 3 the square root of negative 1 becomes I and then don't forget this negative that you've got out front that would be negative 3 I so that's the answer to part A Okay, part B. Notice the 16 is not negative. So this is just an ordinary square root. Square root of 16 is 4. Square root of negative 25. I'll do it in the cloud. You'll start doing this in your mind very soon if you're not already doing it. That would be square root of 25 and square root of negative 1. So the 25 would be 5. Square root of 25 is 5. And the square root of negative 1 is i. And this is how you will do it in practice when you're actually taking a, an exam or a quiz or maybe doing your homework. You go square root 16, boom, 4. Square root negative 25, boom, 5i. Okay, Bring down the plus sign. Last example, or last part of this example, negative 4, ignore it. Kind of like we did over here. Ignore the negative 4, but don't forget it. Anything outside the radical, you just want to ignore it for a second, but don't forget it. Let's work on the 36 first. Negative 36. What's the square root of negative 36? That would be 6i. Then bring down the negative 4. Now multiply them. Negative 24i. Not too bad. Yeah. It is still just basic arithmetic. It's basic arithmetic with a new symbol, yeah? A new member of the family, I. 
the imaginary unit. Uh, maybe let me do a part D, just while I have your attention here. Uh, suppose you had the square root of negative 5 times the square root of negative 20. I'm just adding this in at the last second so that we can uh, com uh, complete that particular piece of it. So what do we got going on here? We got the square root of negative 5 times the square root of negative 20. Okay, these are both imaginary numbers. These are both imaginary. So we're going to simplify them separately. The square root of negative 5 is i times the square root of 5. I'm going to give you a handy little trick. You can just take any negative outside of the radical, remove it, and call it i. Yeah, Because that negative sign really means the square root of negative 1. So anytime you see a negative inside the radical, you may remove it and call it i. And now, times, you've got another one, so you're going to have another i, and then a square root of 20. Now, where do we go from here? We still need to simplify these radicals, yeah? So here's a trick. Why don't we put our i's with our i's and our radicals with our radicals? Don't we always do that in mathematics, right? I's with I's, radicals with radicals, X's with X's, Y's with Y's. So we have I times I, and then we have square root of 5 times the square root of 20. So I times I is I squared. 5 times 20 is 100. Yeah, square root of 5 times the square root of 20, 100. Yeah? So now what? Well, i squared times 10. Because the square root of 100 is 10. Now here's where it gets tricky. Here's where it gets tricky. What is i squared? So we got to do a little... Recall, the square root of negative 1 is equal to i. Yeah, from the very first thing I wrote on the board today. But I don't have i, I have i squared. So i squared, if I square both sides, I get i squared the square root and the square will cancel and I will get negative 1. So let's keep this permanently in our mind now too as well. I squared is negative 1. So this I squared will become negative 1. So now I have negative 1 times 10 and the result is negative 10. In this particular case, the final answer is no longer an imaginary number. Now it's a real number. It's a negative real number, but it is still a real number. Which brings us to our next definition. A complex number. A complex number is a plus bi.
and we'll use a different version of the letter A. So a complex number is A plus BI. A is called the real part. And B is called the imaginary part. And I is called the imaginary unit. So a complex number is built out of two parts, the real part and the imaginary part. The imaginary part is the number, in this case B, that lies to the left of the symbol I, the imaginary unit. So in example four, identify the real part and the imaginary part. Um, I got kind of the bottom of my page here, so I'm just going to do one and then we'll move on to the next one. So, so let's say negative 5 plus 4i, you would say the real part the real part is negative 5 the imaginary part is 4. I'm mainly being specific to whether or not you're using the letter I. That's what I'm specifying here. Notice the imaginary part is not 4i. The imaginary part is just 4. Now, I know what you mean, you know, if you're talking to somebody and you say 4i, then the imaginary part, I understand what that means. But when you type it, you cannot type 4i. You just have to say, the imaginary part is 4. It's understood that it has the letter i because you're using the word imaginary. I know. It's math. We have to be that way. We don't want to be. We have to be. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and continue the same question here. I'm just going to kind of roll, roll it back to the top here. So how about um, 6 minus 5i? All right. Maybe I'll make a note. This actually means 6 plus negative 5 times i. But nobody wants to write 6 plus negative 5. Not even myself. I don't want to write that. So I just write 6 minus 5i. So maybe I'll just put that in one of my clouds so that when I'm reading the question, I understand that that's what that actually means. All right. Although nobody's actually going to write it this way. We'll always write it this way. So the real part is 6. The imaginary part is negative 5. What a number like this, 14. 14 actually means 14 plus 0i. So from now on, you are seeing with new eyes. Yeah, when you see a real number, 
You have to look at it with your eyes. Yeah. So it's 14 plus zero I. So the real part, 14. Imaginary part, I'm just going to abbreviate, imagine, zero. Okay. We have a name for this. When this happens, in other words, when the imaginary part is zero, we call it a pure real number. So this is called a pure real number. It has no imaginary part. See if I have room to squeeze part D down here. Eight I. Okay. Let me do the same thing I did up here. What does eight I really mean? It really means zero plus eight I. That's what this means. So 14, 14 means 14 plus zero I. Eight I, eight I means zero plus eight I. So the real part is zero. There is no real part. Imaginary part is eight. Well, what do you think we're going to call this? Yeah. When this happens, we call this pure imaginary. So part D, pure imaginary. Part C, pure real. Part B, complex. Complex, pure real, pure imaginary. So every number, real, imaginary, complex, can be put into one of these three categories. Complex, pure real, or pure imaginary. Okay, um, for the remainder of this lesson, uh, we're actually going to do some math. I don't, uh, we haven't really done a lot of math yet. We've done a lot of terminology. We've done a lot of simplifying. But when I say doing math, what I mean is traditional mathematics, such as adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, you know, things like that. Let's start with addition. Nice thing about addition um, is it's the fundamental operation of which pretty much all mathematics is built. And once you learn it, you learned it. You've already learned it. You already know how to add. So I'm not really going to be giving a huge you know, lecture on addition. I'm just going to assume that we already understand the concept of addition in its abstract sense. But at, when it comes to imaginary numbers, we have to be very careful. We first have to group the real parts together and the imaginary parts together.
So we group our real with our real, 5 plus negative 8. And we group our imaginary with our imaginary, 6 plus 9. 5 plus negative 8 is negative 3. 6 plus 9 is 15 i. And that is it, my friends. The real and the imaginary stay separate. Real with real, imaginary with imaginary. That's really about it. Um, now, the numbers could be different. Um, there could be different combinations of signs. But the basic idea is when you add, you add real to real and imaginary to imaginary. Won't make too big of a deal about that. Uh, we'll be doing more of this as we move along. Let me run through all four operations, and then we can see how everything works as we move through the material. Subtraction. careful with subtraction. Um, now, I'm not sure how you learned it in whichever class you had, but if you had my basic math or my pre-algebra or something like that, intermediate algebra, anything below this level, and you had me before, you know what I'm about to say. There is no such thing as subtraction. All right? Does that sound familiar? Because there really isn't. Subtraction is an illusion that we've invented as an inverse to addition. Yeah. So, you know, when you say, you know, 5 take away 1 is 4, what you're really saying is 1 plus 4 is 5, All right? So every subtraction problem is really just an addition problem in reverse. So I recommend never subtracting. Distribute the negative sign as if you're multiplying by an invisible negative 1. That's what a subtraction sign means. Subtraction sign means that you are multiplying by negative 1. Now, you won't see the 1. This is what the problem will look like. Yeah, But a subtraction sign means multiplying by negative 1. Yeah. And then you're going to change this to addition. So this becomes an entirely new problem. And the cool thing about this is you don't need to memorize the subtraction rule. Distribute, change to addition, and then use the rule that I just illustrated in the addition problem. So now I've got real with real. These are my reals. And then I've got imaginary with imaginary. I like to put parentheses around the negatives. Although, if you omit the parentheses, you're going to get the same thing. It's just a little bit dangerous. I mean, it's, it's correct. You could omit all of these parentheses, and you're still going to get the same result. Okay. Down here, if I omit the parentheses, it just looks funny. So I'm going to keep them for one more step. So I've got 6 plus 3 is 9. And then I've got negative 9 and negative 13. That's negative 22i. And see how this looks funny? 9 plus negative 22i. So we typically just say 9 minus 22i. Nine minus twenty-two i. So that's subtraction. Multiplication. Probably 
to have to do a couple examples of multiplication because there are several uh, possibilities for this. Um, so I will break this one down into an ABC. Multiplying is a little more complicated. So let's go ahead and do um, 6i times negative 3i. Now I'm just going to do ABC and keep it all as example 8, okay? So um, 6i times negative 3i is 6 times negative 3. Yeah. And then i times i. Uh, you can use parentheses or you can just use a dot. Okay, so remember real with real, imaginary with imaginary. 6 times negative 3 is negative 18. i times i is i squared. Remember our memory cloud that we should keep in mind? i is the square root of negative 1. i squared is negative 1. So i squared is negative 1. I don't want that to look like subtraction. So I put parentheses around it so that it looks like multiplication. Negative times a negative is a positive. That's the right way to say it. Negative 18 times negative 1 is positive 18. If you reflect back on the process, look, the original problem was a positive times a negative. A positive times a negative came out to be a positive. Yeah, it's because we're in the world of imaginaries. And when you're in the world of imaginary numbers, all of those basic rules that you learned when you were 10, 11, 12 years old are gone. Right? It's a whole new ball game now. Whole new set of rules. It doesn't mean that the old rules aren't true anymore. They're still true. It's just they've been extended to a larger set now. Yeah, so we're outside of the real numbers. We're in a much bigger universe. Um, I'm going to have to just do these one at a time. So that's part A. Let's call this part B. So 2i times 5 minus 4i. So this is the distributive property. You're going to distribute the 2i. So now you're going to have 2i times 5. Well, that's 10i. 2i times negative 4i is negative 8. Now be careful, i times i, we just did this, is i squared. Remember, i squared means negative 1. Now be careful, sometimes your brain will trick you. You might think that I said i is negative 1, but that's not what I said. I squared. Excuse me. I squared is negative 1. So now we have 10i. Negative 8 times negative 1 is positive 8. And you must always put the real part first and the imaginary part last. And you might be thinking, do I have to do that on the test? And the answer is yes. Yes, definitely on the test. You want to put your answer in standard form. Standard form of a complex number. In other words, real part first, imaginary part second. That is the standard form of a complex number. OK, 
Okay, still example eight. This is all multiplying. Sorry, it's a six, not a five. getting into it now. <laughs> it's starting to look like algebra now. You have two complex numbers multiplied together. All right. This is sometimes called FOIL. FOIL stands for first pair. That's F. Outer pair. That's O. Inner pair. That's I capital I, and last pair. So FOIL stands for first, outer, inner, last. All right, so first, outer, inner, and last just in case you're a little rusty on your basic algebra. I don't know, some of you might have learned this 10 years ago, and some of you might have learned it 10 months ago, I don't know. So, first pair first, so negative two times three, that's negative six. Outer pair, negative two times negative seven I, that's positive 14 I. Be really careful with your negative signs. Sometimes it's helpful to do this. That way you know that you're multiplying two negative numbers. Do whatever it takes to get it right, okay? Inner pair, six times six I times three, that's gonna be 18 I. And then the last pair, positive 6i, negative 7i, that's negative 42i squared. Just like in basic algebra, you're going to combine your middle terms. So that's going to be 32i. Combine those together. Remember what I squared is. I squared is negative one. Negative 42 times negative one is positive 42. Finally, you wanna put this in standard order. So six, negative six and positive 42 Combine those together to be 36. Negative 6, positive 42 is positive 36. Make sure your final answer is in standard form. Real with real, imaginary with imaginary, and they should never be combined. Keep them separated. This is quite a problem, isn't it? Yeah, well, we're gonna spend a lot of time on multiplying, because as you can probably imagine, multiplication is one of the fundamental operations that you have to be proficient in. Last example. If you see an exponent of a 2, you must rewrite the problem as a multiplication problem. Okay. You want to see a way to instantly fail a question like this, get a zero points on a question like this? If you take that exponent and just put it inside like that, you will always get zero. You'll get no credit whatsoever. So never 
distribute the power. So I don't ever want to see you doing this. All right. Don't do it. The correct way to do it is to rewrite it and use FOIL. That's the correct way to do it. And you know, it'd be nice if you could just go bam, bam, and be done with it, but it just never works out that way. So when you see a power of two, you're going to write it out twice, two copies of exactly the same thing, and then uh, use FOIL. So. Where are we at? Uh, 4 times 4. 4 times 4 is 16. 4 times negative 3. That's negative 12i. Uh, negative 3 times 4. That's another negative 12i. Negative 3 times negative 3. Negative 3i times negative 3i is positive 9i squared. Combine these 12 i's. They're both negative. Negative 12, negative 12 is negative 24. You're combining them. Y'all remember what happens to the i squared? I know I sound like a broken record, don't I? Just say the same thing over and over again. Positive 9 times negative 1 is negative 9. Finally, real part with real part, 16 and negative 9 is 7. And then the 24, negative 24i goes last. And there you go. Okay. <laughs> That's multiplication. You guys ready for division? Yeah. Well, the good news is when we do division, we'll have done all four basic operations, and uh, that means we're getting very close to the end. So. All right. So before we do division, we need some more terminology, some vocabulary. Uh, so here's some vocabulary, A plus BI and A minus BI are called complex conjugates. Called complex conjugates. Sometimes we just say conjugate if the word complex is clear by the section that we happen to be studying. So everything in this section is complex, so I can just say conjugate and you know what I mean, right? Uh, but if I really want to make it extra clear, I'll say complex conjugate. Okay. Math is just like any other language. Once you know what you're talking about, you can ease up on some of the proper vocabulary and just say the day-to-day -day language that we speak, you know, as humans. Okay, so complex conjugates. Notice the A part stays the same, but the B part changes to a negative. What's interesting about complex conjugates is when you when you multiply them. Watch what happens. Something amazing happens. A times A, A squared. A times negative B, so that would be negative A, B, I. We usually put it in alphabetical order. Now watch this. Positive A, B, I. Again, you could say BIA, 
but BIA is the same as ABI. It's the same thing. And then a positive times a negative is a negative B squared I squared. I'm just going to make that fit. Sorry about that. A squared, negative ABI, positive ABI, negative B squared, I squared. Does that fit now? There we go. Now, last time we did a problem like this, the middle terms combined. But this time, they cancel. One of them is negative, the other one is positive, so these guys are gone. There's no more ABIs anymore. So all we have is A squared minus B squared, I squared. But I squared is negative one. So this becomes a squared plus B squared. Yeah. This is now a real number. Yeah, that's a real number now. So before we actually do any division problems, we need to be we need to understand the nature of complex conjugates. And the nature of complex conjugates are they have opposite signs only in the middle. Right? The, the real parts are not opposite. The real parts match. But the middle terms are opposite. And when you multiply them together, you always get a real number. By the way, I should mention that it doesn't matter which way I do this. If this one would have been negative, then this one would have been positive, And they're still called complex conjugates. This one would be negative. This one would be positive. Everything would play out exactly the same way, and you would get exactly the same result. So the order of the conjugation does not matter. Example nine. One more multiply. Three minus five i, three plus five i, these are complex conjugates. So we're automatically going to get three squared plus five squared, which is nine plus 25, which is 34. Done. You can't see the 34, can you? There you go. Done. 34. If you like the long way, you go like this. 3 times 3, 9. 3 times 5i, 15i. Negative 5 times 3i, negative 15i. Negative 5 times positive 5, negative 25, they're both i's, so i squared. Positive 15i and negative 15i cancel out. i squared is negative 1. Negative 25 times negative 1 is positive 25. And what do you know? you still get 34. So if you notice that a problem has complex conjugates, then you can jump directly to this, 3 squared plus 5 squared, in this particular case, and then jump right to the answer. Or you can work the whole thing out. You know, I recommend if you're learning this, or if you, you know, 
are rusty at math, try it both ways. Sometimes do it the easy way, sometimes do it the hard way so that you have a well-rounded understanding of how things work. I'll tell you what, if you do it the easy way and you get it wrong, you're going to wish you would have just spent the extra minute and done it the long way. It also goes the other way. If you do it the long way and you get the answer, you go, oh, I should have just done it the easy way. So, I mean, that's called math. I mean, I can't change the nature of the subject. I mean, it is what it is. I didn't invent it. You know? I was born into this, you know. <laughs> Don't blame me. Finally, we can talk about division. So if I want to do uh, negative 4 plus 6i divided by 10 minus 2i. Um, now, I'm going to do several of these. So let's just call this part A again, and I'll go through several different iterations. Multiplication and division need more than one you know, example to be able to understand it. All right. I mean, maybe you can get it in one, but I mean, it always takes me a couple. So with division, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the denominator. and find the complex conjugate. So what's the complex conjugate of 10 minus 2i? Well, it's 10 plus 2i. Yeah? It's the same numbers, 10 and 2, but with an opposite sign. And I would go ahead and add in a set of parentheses there so that you know that you're multiplying those together. And then make sure that you multiply the numerator and the denominator by 2i. This is what we call a special form of 1. So it's 10 plus 2i on top, 10 plus 2i on the bottom. Now bring your own parentheses. They will not be provided for you. So you, as the student, have to introduce your own parentheses in order to um, solve this correctly or simplify this correctly. That is the division process. Notice that I'm not actually dividing. Yeah? You're going to multiply a special form of 1. That is how you divide. Uh, let's do the top first. So I've got negative 4 times 10. That's negative 40. I got negative 4 times 2i. That's negative 8i. I've got 6 times 10. 6i times 10. That's 60i. And I've got 6i times 2i. That's 12i squared. Now, the denominator is much easier. Yeah? If I want, I can do the long way. 10 times 10, 10 times 2, 2 times 10, 2 times 2. I could do it all out. Or I could use what we just learned. 10 squared plus 2 squared. No more i's. <laughs> no more i's. It's a squared and b squared. That's it. It's that simple. Uh, let's go ahead and simplify the top. We've got negative 40. We've got 52i. Combining the negative 8 and the 60. Um, and then we have negative 12. All right. Notice that i squared is negative 1. So that changes this 12 into negative 12. If you want to show the step, it's 12 times negative 1 in your head there. That's how it became negative 12. Uh, the bottom is much easier. It's 104. Yeah? 10 times 10 is 100. 2 times 2 is 4. So the bottom is 104. Denominator is 104. Combine the like terms here. So you're going to get negative 52 
plus 52i. Uh, it's a coincidence that those are both 52. Uh, divided by 104. All right. And now the complicated part. This is the complicated part. You cannot leave your answer like this. You must simplify if possible. I mean, if it's not possible, you can leave your answer like that. But it's general rule in my class, if you can, then you must. So if it's possible, well, then you have to do it. Yeah. So if you ever have a question, you know, Dr. Jordan, do I need to do that? My answer would be, I don't know. Can you do it? I mean, if you can, then you must. All right, so I'm going to go negative 52 over 104 plus 52i over 104. All right, break it up. Put the 104 underneath each term. This is your A. This is your B. And then if it's possible, simplify it. If it's not, then go back to this. This would be fine. Okay. 52 goes into 104 twice. So that's negative one half, right? If you have to actually write it all out, you'll get a decimal 0.5, or you could factor it out. Uh, make sure that you don't accidentally write two. Right? If the 104 was on top and the 52 was on the bottom, yeah, then it would be negative two, but it's not. So that's one half. Oh, coincidentally, this one's also one half. And then make sure the I goes off to the side or if you want, you can put it up top. Either way, that's fine. Do not put the I back in the bottom. That would be marked incorrect if the I was in the bottom. So I would accept that answer, or I would also accept this answer. That would also be true. Uh, what else would be true? Uh, because it's a 1, you don't even have to write it. You could just say i over 2 because that happens to be a 1i. Yeah. And there's actually one more correct answer. You could just write the 2 once. Yeah, that would also be correct. I probably, personally, if this were my homework, I'd probably just stop right here. So this is tomato, 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 and tomate, you know. There's lots of different ways to say tomato. You guys had enough yet? Yeah, I can tell. Uh, I can kind of hear the, the internet screaming at me. Um, I got to do a part B of this problem, and then I can wrap things up, okay? So example 10. Um, I don't know why I erased that. Division, uh, part B. Negative 3 minus 6i divided by 3i. This one's a little tricky. Um, and what makes it tricky is that the denominator is pure imaginary. The denominator only has one term. So you might think, you know, what's the complex conjugate if something only has one term? Well, what this really means, and let me just do a little cloud over here. What this actually means 0 plus 3i. That's what 3i actually means. So the complex conjugate is 0 minus 3i. If you have 0 plus 3i in the problem, remember you only look at the bottom, the denominator, when you're finding your conjugate, then to find your complex conjugate, you just change the plus into a minus. Um, and I can go ahead and ignore the zero now. And so my special form of one is negative three i. And remember, bring your own parentheses. They will not be provided for you. 
If you want to actually put the zero here, it's not wrong. It just makes more writing for you to do and it makes more steps, but it wouldn't be wrong. I'm going to omit it because zero is zero and it's not necessary to write the zero. Okay, so we're going to use the distributive property. Since this only has one term, you don't have FOIL, you just have FO, F-O, it's half of FOIL. So I've got negative 3i times negative 3, that's going to be 9i squared. Negative 3 times negative 6i is positive 18i squared. Sorry, I made a mistake. I'm glad I caught it. Negative 3i times negative 3 is just 9i. Catch that mistake before I get too far down the road. The second one is negative 6 times negative 3, which is 18i squared. The denominator is 3 times negative 3, which is negative 9. These do both have an i, so it's i squared. Remember that um, i squared is negative 1, so that changes the 18 into negative 18, and it changes the negative 9 into positive 9. If you want a quick mental math way of remembering this, anytime you see i squared, just change it from positive to negative, or from negative to positive, which, whichever way you are. Make sure you write your answer in standard form. So standard form would be negative 18 plus 9i. You have to put this in the right order. And then divide each one of these by 9 separately. And simplify that if possible. Negative 18 divided by 9 is negative 2. Right? The larger number's on top, so it's a whole number, or integer, negative 2. And then 9 divided by 9 is 1i. Or if you prefer, you can just say negative 2 plus i, and that would be your answer. I don't know why I wrote it up there. Maybe I'll write the answer way up here. Negative 2 plus i. And it's OK if you say 1i. That's fine. You can do that. OK, um, that's pretty much it. Um, I do want to just briefly, before I log out here, before I close the, the lecture, I'd like to briefly talk about powers of i. We'll just take a couple minutes to go over those. This is a minor topic. I think there's one question on the homework about this, um, and it may or may not be on the test. So, I mean, I want you to know it, otherwise I wouldn't waste your time. But we want to talk about what happens when you have exponents of i. Uh, the most basic exponent would be 1, yeah? i to the 1. Well, i to the 1 is just i, yeah? And for the sake of argument, I'm not really going to simplify any further than that. All right, so that's as simple as it gets, is i. Then we do i squared, and which we've already done. Remember, done it several times in the past half an hour. i squared is negative 1. But I'm not stopping there. I want to keep going. What happens if the powers get higher and higher and higher? Yeah. So if the powers get higher and higher, what happens? Well, let's see. i cubed, well, look. Look at the pattern here i cubed is just i squared times i to the 1. Yeah. And that's what a cube is, right? A squared times a 1. That's a cube. Yeah. But we already know that i squared is negative 1. And we already know that i to the 1 is i. 
So this is negative 1 times i, which is negative i. And I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep going. i to the fourth. Use what you already know. i to the fourth is i squared times i squared. i to the fourth is two copies of i squared. So that's negative 1 times negative 1. Yeah, each of these i squares is a negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. Ah, look. i, negative 1, negative i, 1. I sense a pattern. i to the fifth. i to the fifth is i cubed times i squared. Or i squared times i cubed. Yeah, either one. What's i cubed? i cubed is negative i. What's i squared? Look back up here. i squared, negative 1. What's negative i times negative 1? Back to i again. And this is called the i cycle. A cycle is, you know, like the sun going around, I mean, the, the earth going around the sun. <laughs> I almost said the sun goes around the earth. You know what I mean. The earth goes around the sun. That's a cycle, right? It goes around and it comes right back to the same place every year. You go out on June 21st and you're back to the summer solstice again. We just had that a couple days ago. And in 365 and a quarter days, you're going to end up right back at that exact same spot again. Yeah cyclic goes around like a cycle yeah this is called the i cycle it repeats this pattern over and over and over again kind of like the seasons spring summer fall winter spring summer fall winter spring summer fall winter and it always goes around in that way over and over and over and over again just like the seasons of the year. So there are only four seasons in the I cycle. It starts with negative with I, and then it goes to negative one, and then it goes to negative I, and then to one, and then back around and around and around and around. And so I would be if the power is one, five, 9, just keep adding 4, 13, 17, etc., 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 etc. Negative 1 would be if the power is 2, add 4, 6, add 4, 10, add 4, 14, etc., etc., etc. Negative i would be if the power is, start with 3, and then add 4, 7, add 4, 11, add 4, 15, etc., etc., etc. And then finally, 1 if the power is 4, 8, 12, 16, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my last example before I shut this down is the I cycle. I'm going to give you a very big power, although it won't be that big, you know, maybe like 30 or 40 or 90 or something like that. Most of them are less than 100. And I want you to figure out where you are on the I cycle. It always has to be one of these four seasons. I literally think of them like the seasons, yeah? Summer, fall, winter, spring. Summer, fall, winter, spring. Summer, fall, winter, spring, yeah? Or if you live here in the desert, summer and then everything else, yeah? <laughs> it's, it's either summer or it's not summer. Those are pretty much the only two times of year. So the last example 
um, simplify the powers of i. Let's just do maybe two of these. Um, let's say um, i to the 73rd power. And let's do i to the 42nd power. Now, by the way, if you totally forget and it happens to be on a test or something, just count. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. What? Just go around and around and around and around until you get to 73. 73 will end up somewhere on that cycle, and wherever it lands, that's where it lands. Just make sure you start at the north. You know, start in the north, that's your summer, and then go around counterclockwise if you want to get it right. All right. Here's the trick, okay? Just use a little math and divide this by four. Always divide by four. Don't use your calculator. Your calculator will screw you up. So four goes into seven one time. Bring down the three. Four goes into 33 eight times. Remainder one. So this is I to the fourth to the 18th times I to the one. The remainder always goes last. The remainder always goes last. Okay. You want to learn a little vocabulary. This is called the quotient. And the divisor is always four. Why four? Because there are four seasons. Yeah. Summer, fall, winter, spring. Summer, fall, winter, spring. Goes round and round and round. So it's always divisor and then quotient. And then remainder goes last. The divisor is always going to end up being 1 because i to the fourth power is 1. We memorize that. 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, 18 times is still just 1. And so the final answer is just i. Let's try that again. All right. Uh, what do we got? We got I to the 42nd power. So let's do a little scratch work. 42 divided by 4. Uh, that would be, um, let's see, 1 times 4. That would be 10. The remainder of 2. Yeah. 10 times 4 is 40, and the remainder is 2. So you always want to go divisor. It's always going to be 4. Then the quotient. And then the remainder goes outside. Remember, if the divisor is 4, then that power will always come out to be 1. So you've got 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, 10 times, which is still just 1. So you're just going to get I squared. Now don't stop. I squared is negative 1. So your final answer must always be one of those four possibilities. Now, on your homework, you can just guess four times, and you're guaranteed to get it on the fourth time. On the test, you only get one chance. So you do not want to be guessing on the test. And yes, yes, this is definitely going to be on the test. Okay, um, I got to go. Office hours. Um, if you need me, log into Zoom. Um, Dr. Jordan, signing out. Until then, see you on the internet.